All right, so we are continuing with continuous distributions. All right, as I was saying, we're continuing with continuous distributions. Um, we'll be in it on this topic today and Monday. Um, and I believe we are going to finish this section on Monday. We'll probably even be able to start the next one on uh, on Monday. So um, what will be left over after today shouldn't require two hours. But but that's um, that's what's going on. So the next topic is bivariate distributions. And so we've done discrete, where x can only be integers. We're tackling um, continuous now, where x can have decimal values, so it's more smooth or continuous. And then what will come next is, well, what about if you don't just have an x, but you have an x and a y? So you've got the distribution of height and weight, you know, two variables simultaneously working together. Um, so that's, that's what will come up next. But let's, uh, let's just focus on the gamma distribution, which is this first topic today. You have the PMF, or the PDF, sorry, probability density function of the gamma distribution given here in yellow. You've got some funky notation that you may or may not have seen before. Theta is um, some unknown parameter. It would have a value. It would normally be given. Alpha is another parameter. So gamma distribution is a distribution of x, but it has two parameters. What I mean by that is you've seen <coughs> only functions, excuse me, with one parameter up to this point. <coughs> you know, binomial um, had P, Bernoulli had P, um, Poisson had lambda. So there is one parameter in each of those, but here you have alpha and theta. Uh, for those of you that might, you know, research things more online, you may come across alpha and beta. So sometimes theta is called beta. Sometimes theta is one over beta. So if you see a slightly different form than what I'm presenting here, that's probably why. But, <clears throat> but this in general is going to be your form. You've got x to the power of alpha minus one and the exponential or e to the negative x over theta. You also have a function in the denominator here, which is ga the gamma function of alpha. The gamma function is not, <coughs> is not the gamma distribution. There's act an actual function for it. It's an integral. I won't expect you to, to look it up on your own or even to remember it. Um, we're really not going to make use of it. We're going to make use of tricks of the gamma function, which I'll get to um, some of those tricks in a moment. A special case of the gamma distribution is when your alpha is one. So x corresponds to the waiting time. And when you're interested in the waiting time to the first change or first success, whatever it might be, that simplifies to this next PMF in the middle here. You'll notice that when alpha is one, that your theta to the first power is theta, your x to the one minus one or x to the zero becomes one, so there's no um, x power on in, uh, in the second yellow term. And gamma of one is one, and I'll explain why shortly. And so it happens to simplify to this, and you've seen a distribution like this on the, in the last lesson. This is known as the exponential distribution. So it is a very well-known distribution. It's, it's pretty simple, and that's going, going to be its form. Notice the support for both of these. I mean, since exponential comes from gamma, they have to have the same support, is that x is going to be non-negative. So x where they're equal to 0. So if you're integrating the entire integral, it would be the integral from 0 to infinity. And then. There's another special case, so another distribution. This is going to be called the chi-square distribution. It's written with 
it kind of looks like an X squared, but it's the, the Greek symbol or Greek letter chi. I'm looking over here in case you're not sure where I'm looking at. And so that is chi square with the parameter R. And this is a gamma distribution where alpha is two and your theta is R over two. And you'll see how to recognize if any of these special cases um, happen to fit or be able to be used in, uh, in some of these coming problems. So I'm just kind of giving you some background here. Let me fill in some information that's not on here. And I want to give you some shortcuts with that gamma function that you saw a moment ago. And so properties, of the gamma function. Remember, this gamma function is not the gamma distribution, so it's not the PDF. So it's this, this gamma of X notation. So gamma of N is going to be n minus one factorial, where n is an integer. So that's one property, which is why just before, when, um, when we were evaluating gamma of alpha at alpha of one, that is gamma of one is zero factorial and zero factorial is one. So that's where that came from. In general, gamma of X is going to be X times, uh, hold on. That's going to be X minus one of gamma of X minus one. And this is where X is greater than <coughs> or equal to one. <coughs> so if this holds when you have even a non-integer value, um, it's going to satisfy the property above that I first listed, even if it were an integer. So if this was, if X were two, this is going to be one times the gamma of one, but gamma of one is zero factorial. And so it'll still, it'll still work out. But this is one that you could use if you have, let's say, gamma of 6.3. So you could keep making use of this just as an example. Let me do an example of each of these. So gamma of 4, let's say, is going to be 3 factorial. And if this were gamma of 6.3, then that's going to be 5.3 times gamma of 5.3. <clears throat> but gamma of 5.3 can still be manipulated. So that's going to be 5.3 times 4.3 times the gamma of 4.3. And gamma of 4.3 could be manipulated based on the property above. And <clears throat> so hopefully you're seeing a pattern in the end, this is going to be 5.3 times 4.3 times 3.3 times 2.3 times 1.3 times 0.3 times gamma of 0.3. And so if we keep kept applying that second blue property that I wrote, gamma of x equals x minus one times gamma of x minus one, it will simplify to this form. So it's nice because you're able to either manipulate your gamma function or possibly solve for it and, and um, know exactly what it is like in that first property. There is one more unique case and that is gamma 
of a half. And this is the square root of pi. <clears throat> so these three properties are just ones that, that you'll just have to commit to memory. Um, they'll always hold, we won't necessarily always need them. We'll see if we need them in any of, the, any of the problems that we're about to do, but I at least wanted to make you aware of them so that if it comes up, I could refer to it. You could see, oh, that's how you make use of it and, uh, and how I got some answers. Questions before we actually get into some of the problems? What is that arrow? Yeah, before point three. Is that is that the gamma? Yeah, that is that is my gamma notation. So that is the gamma function evaluated at point three. Wouldn't that be that would be less than one? Well, <clears throat> without without actually integrating and using the gamma function, you wouldn't you wouldn't solve for it. So you can't you can't apply any of these um, properties to the gamma evaluated at point three. You would you so would, you just leave it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm. It's not important to me that you actually be able to solve for the gamma function unless you could simplify it with one of these properties. So I'm not even going to present what the gamma function is equal to. If you're curious, you're welcome to look it up, but it's, it's not a critical thing that, that you're gonna need to make use of um, for me. All right, so let's take a look at problem one. And it says customers arrive in a certain shop <clears throat> at an approximate Poisson process. So this is a process, not Poisson distribution. So a Poisson process with a mean rate of 20 per hour. What is the probability the shopkeeper will have to wait more than five minutes for the arrival of the first customer? And so as I read through this, I think, okay, well, X is the time till something happens. In this case, a customer arrives, but we want to know the time until the first customer arrives. And when I look back at these descriptions, I realize, well, there's a special case when X is the waiting time until the first change. In this case, that is a customer arrives, and this is an exponential distribution. So that is given, given to us right there. So alpha is going to be one, which simplifies to that yellow, the second yellow highlighted form. So I'm gonna make use of that. So again, this is indicating use the exponential distribution. which is great. So now I need to figure out, well, what is, what is the probability that I want? So we want to know the probability of waiting more than five minutes. So that is, we want the probability that X is greater than five, which by definition is the area under the curve from five up to infinity. And I know it's going up to infinity because the support, according to either of these distributions, is x greater than or equal to zero, so it's going from zero to infinity, <coughs> of f of x dx. Wait, what is the support? It's highlighted in yellow on the right side. Do you see it, Sydney? Oh. I just underlined it. Yes? No? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so the support for gamma or exponential or chi-square, because both of those come from the gamma distribution, 
is x greater than or equal to zero. So it, it zero onwards in the positive direction. How come um, the number one a can't be used some, with something like the, the negative uh, binomial or something? Because you're like, the, or like the geometric or something? Because it's like the rival of the first customer. So in that case, x is looking at when it's looking at a count. And so it wants to know the probability of when you have your first customer. But here we want to know the probability with respect to time until you have your first customer. And so the difference is your focus. One is looking at the count or number of customers. So X represents the number of changes Whereas in this case, X in the continuous sense is looking at the time until the change and time is continuous. So wait, so you're, you're looking at a given number for the geometric? So geometric is looking at counts. That is the probability that you will have to speak to 10 people before you find the first one that says they support Black Lives Matter. So X there represents a count. Here it would be, what is the probability that it takes you seven hours before you encounter the first person that says they support Black Lives Matter? So you see the difference? X is defined differently. Even though it sounds Similar in the first case, X represents a count, the number of people that you need to talk to. In the second case, X represents time and or duration until you encounter what you're looking for. Hmm. So this is time. Yeah, it's going to be um, it's going to be some continuous concept. In this problem, it's time. All right, so we need to figure out what theta is. Now theta, I'll put this here. Theta is related to the lambda from Poisson in that it is the reciprocal. It's going to be 1 over lambda. Now we're told that the Poisson process has a mean rate of 20. And we know that the mean of Poisson is what? Does anyone remember? We derived the mean of the Poisson distribution. What is it? Yeah, good job, Nan. And so we know that lambda, which is the mean of the Poisson distribution, is 20. So that implies that theta is 1 over 20. And you could convert that to decimal form if you want. It's, it's fine to leave it as is, which now I know what the explicit form of the PDF is. So we are going to integrate from 5 to infinity of, so the exponential is 1 over theta, so that's 1 over 1 20th e to the negative x over theta dx. And this simplifies a little bit. Some of you may have jumped to this already, which is fine. Um, I'm just spelling it out. So this is the same as the integral from 5 to infinity of 20 times e to the negative 20x dx. <clears throat> That's what we want to integrate and evaluate. Uh, I've got a great glare in here. All right, so when you integrate this, You've got negative e to the negative 20x. 
that you are evaluating from five up to infinity. <clears throat> this is an improper integral. So again, I should have brought limits into it. And so this is the limit as a goes to infinity of negative e to the negative 20, 20a minus a negative e to the negative 100, because I did 20 times 5. And I know that this limit, so as a gets bigger, e is going to a larger and larger negative power, which is equivalent to 1 over e to a really large positive value. value. And so e to a positive power that gets bigger and bigger becomes a larger number. And so 1 over a larger and larger and larger number gets smaller, meaning it's approaching 0. And what we're left with is e to the negative 100. Which is pretty small. I'm getting 3.72 times 10 to the negative 44. It's a good question. Um, I will have to look that one up because to be honest, I just remembered that that is the relationship, but I don't remember the justification for it. So the question is, why does theta equal one over lambda? Um, and again, I'll need to, to research again what, what the proof is of that relationship because um, I don't remember it offhand, but I'll get back to you. Yeah, for now, uh, for now it's a given. Um, but since you asked, you know, I'll try to find out, um, refresh my memory as to the justification for it. Other questions before we look at number two. What is the R? We haven't made use of that yet. Give me. Give me just a moment and you will, you will discover what R is. You'll see that in just a minute. All right. Just hold on. I'm going to look at 1B here. Read it if, uh, if you haven't done so already. All right, so it says, what is the probability the shopkeeper will have to wait more than five minutes for the arrival of the first two customers? So similar scenario, but now the number of changes or the number of customers that they're interested in has changed, altered. So alpha is no longer one. That's the point to part B. Part A it was because we want to know the time to the first customer, but now we're looking at the time to, um, to the second customer. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Okay. I apologize. I made, I got caught by a trick in the first problem. And the trick is here. that the rate given was in by hour, yet the X is in minutes. So I need to convert, um, I need to convert the rate with respect to minutes. And so that's going to, that's going to have an impact, but I'll try to make those changes within the work that I've shown. So hopefully you guys can can follow along. So lambda is 20 per hour, <clears throat> but hour is minutes. So this is 20 over 60 or one third, which means theta is going to be three. This is going to have a big impact on our, on our final answer. So that is going to change details so that here that should be one third that's going to be a third or three theta and wait why are you changing it to 60 because i had to the rate is in hours, whereas what we're interested in is with respect to minutes. You can't mix and match. There we go. And so here, Now we've got negative e to the negative x over three is our integral, which is this limit negative e to the negative a over three. That's not going to affect that limit. That limit's still going to disappear. But what is changing is that now we've got e to the negative 5 thirds, which is going to be our answer. And that will have a much larger probability. of 0.1889. So there's about a 19% chance that they will have to wait more than five minutes for their first customer to arrive. Which if you're a business owner, maybe you're happy with that probability. It's pretty small. You know, you'd want it to be, to be small. This is, that rate is still used in part um, B, which we haven't tackled yet, but we're about to. So now in part B, alpha is no longer one, alpha is two. Our theta value is still, is still the same. We're still looking at minutes. And so theta is still three which means that working from the gamma distribution, f of x is going to be one over gamma of alpha, which is two, theta to the alpha power, which is three squared, x to the alpha minus one, e to the negative x over theta, which is three. And this simplifies a little bit We've got one over gamma of two is one factorial using 
the first property here because two is an integer. One factorial is one, so that doesn't have to be written in. Three squared is nine, so this is one ninth. X to the two minus one is just X to the first power, and the exponential doesn't change in any way. So this is our simplest form of the PDF. <clears throat> we want the probability that X is greater than five. So we want to know the probability of having to wait more than five minutes. But in this case, it's for two customers to arrive. Now, it doesn't mean that, um, that they both arrive at the same time. It could be one arrives, you know, maybe within three minutes, but then the next one is at five and a half minutes. So um, the time until you have seen two customers. <clears throat> and then we want to evaluate this. So according to how you make use of continuous distributions. We are integrating from five up to infinity of this PDF, which is one ninth x e to the negative x over three dx. What integration method would you use in order to evaluate this? Integration by parts. Mm -hmm. Integration by parts or last class, I think it was, um, I demonstrated the tabular method. If you happen to know it or catch on, you're welcome to make use of that too. Um, but since this is just integration, I'm going to give you a few minutes to evaluate this on your own and, uh, and get the probability. So it, um, I'll give you a tip that it will be close to 50%. So if your answer is near there, you probably did it right. And so take some time to work on that. I'm going to pause the video and I'll regroup in a, a minute or so. Wait, was it, um, is that zero minus that whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these zeros came from the limit of of this part. And so when you evaluate the limit of the x e to the negative x term and the limit of the e to the negative x over 3 term um, as x or a, with the way I demonstrated it, goes to infinity, that's going to be 0. Is that what you were asking, Sydney? Oh, this all right, so I'll just, um, since I just started the video back up, if you're still copying, I'll just reiterate again what, uh, what I had said off video. So for this problem, we had, um, we had made use of the chi-square distribution, because that is when alpha is 2. And you can define theta at, in an r over 3 or R over um, two fashion. We didn't solve it using chi-square distribution table um, just because the, uh, the table wouldn't have been usable for, for this particular problem. You wouldn't have found five in the table. And uh, I'll see if I could create a problem later or maybe one comes up where you can make use of a table just so you see what I'm talking about. But this one was simple enough that solving with integration by parts or the tabular method would, uh, would work out. I had demonstrated the integration by parts over here. Um, so feel free to stop the video on this screen so that you could take a closer look at it or try to do it on your own. So that was kind of a refresher of the integration by parts. The tabular method is presented on the left side, the bottom left over here. But in the end, you should get 8 thirds times e to the negative 5 over 3 which using a calculator comes out to 0 0.5037. So it's about half or 50% chance that it's going to take more than five minutes to have two customers for whatever business this is. Any questions before we take a look at problem two? All 
All right, so two says, suppose that a certain type of electronic component has an exponential distribution with a mean life of 500 hours. If X denotes the life of this component, then F of X, which is the PDF, is given by this distribution here. So in this case, we're given the PDF. We don't have to try to create it from scratch. If a component has been working for 300 hours, how likely is it to continue for another 600 hours? And so this is what we want to, <clears throat> to be able to figure out or work with. What is the probability that we are looking for here? So let's try to put that last statement or question into probability notation. It says, if a component has been working for 300 hours, so if, so that's given, how likely is it to continue for another 600? And so that means we want to know the probability that X is at least 900 hours given that X has been working for at least 300 hours. So this is a conditional probability. The 900, in case you don't see it, is because it's saying how likely is it to continue for another 600 hours and it's already done 300 or at least 300 so that means at least 900. That's where that number came from. Now the cool thing about this <coughs> is that the exponential distribution is a memoryless distribution and we saw memorylessness with the was it the geometric distribution. Yeah, so we came across, we proved it there. You could prove it for this one on the side, um, just so you have the confidence in that. But what this essentially means is that what has happened in the past doesn't matter. And so this probability is the same as the probability of lasting at least 600 hours. And so now that we figured out exactly what this is looking for, we can just solve directly. So this is the integral from 600 up to infinity. The PDF's given there, it's one over 500. E to the negative T over 500 DT. And this is a slightly easier integral than the one that you just had. So again, I'm gonna give you a minute or so to, to solve this one, figure out what the probability is. And um, again, feel free to call it out or post it under the chat. I'll pause the, uh, the recording here and we'll start back up shortly. All right, welcome back and I see that at least two got the right probability, which should be 0 0.3012. And where that came from, when you integrate this, you should get negative e to the negative t over 500, which you are evaluating from 600 onwards up to infinity. And the limit as t gets larger and larger is zero minus negative e to the negative 600 over 500, which is 6 fifths. And when you compute this, you get 0 0.3012 about. Yeah, so I hope, I hope more of you were able to get that, even, even if you didn't share or brag that on, uh, on the chat, the chat portion. Problem three is going to require a table. So before we do that, I just want to find out, are there any questions on what we've done so far? Again, don't forget either take yourself off mute if you're trying to talk to me or chat your question so that I can see it.
All right, so let me direct you to a table. Eventually I will post, um, post a, an explicit table for you guys to use. I just didn't get to that. And so you could really look up any appropriate table, but I did find one that's, that's decent. And I want to do a search for chi I square distribution table. And you should find one at richland.edu. So it says people.richland.edu. It's like one, two, three, four, fifth one down around. <clears throat> and I'm going to refer to this table in just a moment. Let me demonstrate how I know to, uh, to get to this table. So let's go back and look at problem three. I'll just pause here for a moment in case you, you haven't searched for the table yourself. Anyone need more time to, uh, to look the table up? Yeah. All right, Sydney, just let me know when you got it. Okay. All right. All right. Probably should have sent it like a link first. So let me let me do that too, just so we have it here. There you go. That would have been faster, but <clears throat> less challenging. All right. So we're taking a look at problem three which says that telephone calls arrive at a switchboard at a mean rate of one call every two minutes, according to a Poisson process. So I know that Lambda is one call per two minutes, or half a call a minute if you wanna view it that way. <clears throat> Let X denote the waiting time in minutes. So that's good, I'm checking up front now that um, we're only dealing with minutes. X is the waiting time in minutes until two and a half calls arrive. How likely is it? So I know that alpha is 2.5 calls. I know that theta, which is one over lambda, is going to be two. How likely is it to take between 1.145 and 12.83 minutes for two and a half calls to arrive? <clears throat> Which means the probability that I want to find is the probability that X is between 1.145 and 12.83 minutes. Now, <clears throat> based on this information, you know, I'm just making sure I didn't miss the detail, right? Based on this information, we've got one over gamma of 2.5. This is our PDF that I'm putting together, two to the 2.5 power. x to the 2.5 minus 1 power, which is 1.5, e to the negative x over theta, and theta is 2, <clears throat> so that gets me here. So here is the probability that we want to find
I'm just making sure. I feel like I have a typo. Let's do alpha. I do have a typo. The 2 and 2.5 should actually be switched. So the mean rate, that is going to be 2.5, one call every 2.5 minutes. And X is the waiting time in minutes until two calls arrive. So this is going to give us a chi-square distribution. <clears throat> Let me put it in the correct form because with the original values, it didn't work out appropriately. So how does that change things? That this should be one over 2.5, one call per two and a half minutes, which two and a half is five halves or two-fifths, which, let's see. I need theta to come out to a particular value, otherwise this won't make sense. So let me just rework this. All right, so <clears throat> what I was fixing was the 2 and the 2.5 need to be switched in order for the, the problem to be correct. And you'll see why in a moment. And so lambda is really one call per two and a half minutes, which means theta is 2.5. And that is going to make a few changes. here. So alpha is 2. This is going to be 2.5 squared. X is going to be to the alpha minus 1 or 2 minus 1, which is just 1. And E to the negative X over theta. Theta is 2.5. And so this is our actual PDF. <clears throat> now because alpha is 2, and let me correct that here. Because alpha is 2, this is a gamma 2 comma 2.5 distribution. <clears throat> but that, when alpha is 2, that implies this is a special case of a chi-square distribution. I need to know what R is. And up here, I could see that theta is r over 2. We know theta. Theta is 2.5. And so if I work with that, and I realize that if theta is r over 2 and theta is 2.5, then using algebra to solve for r, r is going to be 5. And so that means that this distribution not only is a gamma 2 comma 2.5 distribution, but it's a special case where it's a chi-square with 5 as r. r is known as degrees of freedom. It's going to be a while before you, you really hear that term more, but if you wanted to know it, because if you come across it, that's what R is. It's called the degrees of freedom. And so the degrees of freedom for this problem is 5. You can go ahead and integrate this PDF, which is fine. But for this one, I know that we're actually able to make use of the chi-square table. And I'm going to do that by realizing that this probability that we're interested in the probability of the area between two values 
is the same as the area to the left of the bigger one, which is 12.83. And then I have to remove or subtract the area to the left of the smaller one. So I want two left-tailed regions or probabilities. It's at this point I want to go back to our chi-square table that we just looked up, which is over here. And this table, you'll see at the top, it describes what the table gives us. The areas given across the top are the areas to the right of what's called the critical value, which you could just think of as your chi-square value for now. So these are right-tailed probabilities. Keep that in mind. So look up an area to the left, subtract it from one. We're gonna make use of that. And the first column, you'll notice that the label is DF. That is shorthand for degrees of freedom. And so in our case, we are looking at five degrees of freedom. So you're gonna look in the row with the five in it. And I'm going to be looking for the two chi-square values that we were interested in, which were 1.145, which you should notice in the one, two, three, the fourth white column over, over here. <clears throat> and that area to the right is 0.95, which means the area to the left is 0 0.05. And then I'm also going to look up 12.83, which is about here, still in the five degrees of freedom row. And that area to the right is 0 0.025, which has the area to the left of 0 0.975. So again, the two left held areas are 0.975 and 0 0.05. And now, remembering those numbers, I know that this area is 0.975. This one was 0 0.05. When you subtract the smaller from the larger, you've got 0 0.925. And again, you should get this or really, really, really close to it if you actually integrate the, uh, the PDF that I wrote above. <clears throat> it's not a hard PDF to evaluate, it's integration by parts again, but um, you know, in this case, you were able to use the table. So sometimes the table is, is handy, especially if you have funny looking values like 1.145 and 12.83. It's probably an indication that you should be using the table because the table has funny looking values. If you look at the previous problems that we did, we had um, more pleasant, you know, pleasing values to, uh, to make use of. And so we, we couldn't make use of the, um, the chi-square table. For example, I'll point out in 1B where alpha was two, you may have thought to use the chi-square table now, now that you've seen it once already being used for, but the, probability or the chi-square value of five, such a nice, simple number, isn't in the table. And so um, you're welcome to try to look for it just for the experience, but it's not there. You'd be able to write an interval for the probability, but you wouldn't actually be able to get an explicit answer like we did for the problem that we just went through. So again, just to reiterate, once we fix those two typos in this problem, the two minutes should be two and a half. The, we're interested in the probability that the time is in an interval for two calls to arrive. This is gonna give us a chi-square distribution. We found R because theta is R over two and we know theta. So working backwards, we got R to be five. And so that is the degrees of freedom for the chi-square distribution for, for this problem. And then we went to a table I happen to, you know, to give you a link here, but we looked it up on the side. 
And using the table in the five degrees of freedom row, we looked for 12.83 and 1.145 in order to get the corresponding left tail probabilities. You could do it with right tail probabilities and it, and it works out um, more out of habit I do to the left, but, but both directions would work. You just need the same direction for each probability. Don't, don't mix and match. Let's take a look at number four. <clears throat> so the next problem says that a group of engineers are designing the next generation of space shuttles. They plan to install a system of two fuel pumps where one is active and the other is kept in reserve. If the first one fails, the backup will immediately come online. A typical mission is expected to require a fuel pump for no more than 50 hours. According to the manufacturer's specifications, pumps are expected to fail once every 100 hours. What are the chances that such a fuel pump system will not remain functioning for the full 50 hours? So that's the, the problem and the information that's given. We are going to assume that failures follow a Poisson process. Um, it's kind of one of those underlying assumptions. You saw in other problems that it explicitly said Poisson process. We're going to make, um, make the assumption that a Poisson process holds so that we can make use of a gamma distribution. We're given a rate for this assumed Poisson process that lambda is, and let's see, where is it said? According to the manufacturer's specifications, pumps are expected to fail once every 50 hours. So one fail per, per 50 hour. Oh, I think I, sorry, I skipped line. According to the manufacturer's specifications, pumps are expected to fail once every 100 hours. That's what the sentence actually says. So for us, we have that lambda is one fail every 100 hours. <clears throat> that means that our theta value, which is one over lambda, is 100. The PDF used to detect the second pump breaking down, because <clears throat> remember that is for the fuel pump system to fail, you need both pumps to, uh, to break down. So here, alpha is two, which means that f of x is going to take the gamma distribution of gamma of two, or sorry, one over gamma of two, 100 squared x to the two minus one, e to the negative x over 100. And so this is a gamma 2 comma 100 distribution. It's also chi-square, um, but it has pretty large degrees of freedom, which to be honest, I don't even know if our table goes that high. Let me take a look. So r is going to be 200. And yeah, our table doesn't even go that big. There might be tables out there that do, but um, it's not a very common thing to go that high. And this is a relatively simple PDF, x is to the first power, so integrating it is just one integration by parts. What do we want to know? We want to find the probability that it doesn't remain functioning for the full 50 hours, which means that it fails within 50. <clears throat> so we want the probability that x is less than 50. We have the PDF, so we could set this up. This is the integral from 0 to 50, because remember that for gamma exponential and chi-square, x is greater than or equal to zero, so zero is the smallest bound. And our PDF is one over gamma of two. Gamma of two is one factorial, so it's, it's one if you didn't happen to see that. 100 squared, I'm gonna leave as is, but you could square it out if you wanted. 
x e to the negative x over 100 dx. So you would evaluate this. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you the answer. You've already practiced um, integration by parts, <clears throat> but I think the setup is really where the work should, should be. But it's good for you to do it and make sure that you're able to get it on the side. You should get 0 0.0902 as the answer to this integral or the probability. So there's a 9% chance or probability that this fuel pump system is going to fail within 50 hours which may be good. I mean, you probably don't want it to fail pretty quickly. Wait, okay. why is alpha equal to two? Because you are told that they plan to install, this is the second, second sentence, they plan to install a system of two fuel pumps where one is active and the other is kept in reserve. So that reserve one doesn't come on until the first one fails. But what we want to know is the chance that the fuel pump system does not remain functioning, <clears throat> which implies the chance that both fail, which means the first has to come on, then fail, which is gonna inspire the second one to turn on, and that one has to fail. So we need the probability of the time until two fail. And alpha represents the number of failures or number of events that you are waiting for, waiting to happen. Um, wait, it's uh, expected to fail every 100 hours. Right, that's a rate. So there will be one fail in every 100 hours, but that's, that's an expectation, that's an average. It doesn't mean that one will fail in 100 hours. It might last yeah. 150 or it could die in 75 hours. So um, it's just on average, some last longer or shorter. Um, so you're expecting both to fail for 50 hours? Well, we're not expecting. We want to know how likely is it that both fail within 50 hours. And intuitively, since one should last about 100 hours, it seems reasonable to have a small probability for this answer. The likelihood of both failing within 50 should be small, and, and it is. It's only 9%. All right, there's just one more problem for this handout. <clears throat> it says students arrive at a local bar and restaurant according to an approximate Poisson process at a mean rate of 30 students per hour. What is the probability that the bouncer has to wait more than three minutes? So I'm gonna highlight that because we missed it earlier. More than three minutes to card the next student. <clears throat> so we've got different units here. We're gonna to wanna to convert that 30 into with respect to minutes. <clears throat> So what is that? So we know that lambda is 30 students per hour. How many students per minute is that? Five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, half a student or one student every two minutes, whatever, whichever way you want to think of it. And again, we converted the hour into minutes because our probability is with respect to a minute, in particular, three minutes. And so we want, what is the probability that the bouncer has to wait more than three minutes to card the next student? <clears throat> so let's figure out what our PDF form is. Being that lambda is one half, theta is going to be one over a half, which is two. 
So we have our theta value. And alpha, we just want to know next student, so that's going to be 1, which implies we are going to be dealing with an exponential distribution. So that means that our f of x is 1 over theta, which is 1 half, e to the negative x over theta, which is x over 2. And this is our PDF. <clears throat> so what's the probability that we're looking for? We want the probability that x, which is waiting time, is more than 3. What are the bounds of your integration? Three to infinity? Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> so three to infinity, our PDF we just formulated is one half e to the negative x over two. And this you would just integrate. So this is a, a fairly direct and simple one here. <clears throat> and when you integrate this, which again, I will leave it to you to do on the side, you should get a value really close to 0.2231. You can, um, since, uh, yeah, no, there's no other shortcut for this one. Um, integrating directly is, is going to be the, the easiest route. Any questions? Again, four and five, we built up together. I didn't actually do the integration with you because I trust that you guys are adept at integrating. You had to get through the calculus part in order to get here. Um, but it's good practice in, uh, in case you, you feel a little weak on it. So feel free to integrate on the side to, uh, to confirm that you're able to get these two answers. Any questions on any of the problems for, uh, for the gamma exponential chi-square handout here? I have a question about uh, the one where we looked at the chart. Mm -hmm. um, Which so three. Yeah, I still don't know where you get the the numbers, like the 0.975 and stuff. Like, I know you looked at the chart, but I, I don't know. Can you go back to it or something? Because I don't. Uh, let's. Let me pull that table in here. I hope this works. <clears throat> oh, it only puts a link in. Mm. No. Okay, I was hoping, hoping that um, <clears throat> that I could write on it, but I don't see a, a writing feature here. So, <clears throat> the top sentence says that the areas across the top row are areas to the right, which means that when I look in, in this row and I find 1.145, that column is in the 0.95 column. I'm looking straight at the yellow box on top of that column. Do you see it, Sydney? Oh. Yes, no? Yeah. yeah. And so visually, uh, 
that's 1.145. And the other number was 12.83 about. We're interested in this area between the two. That's what we want to know. The way I set up my problem is that I want to know this region. <clears throat> and I have, according to that table, I have the area from here to the right. I know that's 0 0.95. And that arrow is corresponding to the area under the curve to the right of 1.145. So if there's 0.95 to the right, and the total area has to be one, that implies that this piece is 0 0.05. Did you all follow that? Anyone? Yes. All right, great. <clears throat> so then I went and I looked up 12.83. And that <clears throat> is further to the right in that row. 12.83 is in the column with a right tail probability of 0 0.025. Sydney, do you see that value? Uh, wait. Uh the point eight three, right? Twelve point eight three. Yeah. Where's that? Oh wait. Uh the son of the point zero two five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a right tail probability. So that means that this area to the right of 12.83 is 0 0.025. But that implies that this region is 0 0.975. But I want the diagonal black shaded region, <clears throat> which means the 0.975 is too much because it includes the green area also. So I want to remove that 0.05. So this region must be 0.975 minus the green region of 0.05, which is 0.925. Now visually, you could also see I could have done two right tail probabilities and done 0.95 minus the right tail 0.025, and you'll get the same answer. And that's not a minus sign. All right, I hope that clarified. Any any other questions? Why do you ask right tail? Because it tells me that. Right at the top. The area is given across the top. Our areas to the right of. That's how I know that those numbers in yellow on top are right tailed probabilities.
Okay. Does anyone else have any any other questions? All right, I just am going to introduce the next topic. We're not going to do any sample problems from it just for the sake of time, but at least we'd like to go through <clears throat> the summary part of it, which, which is pretty short. And for those of you that may have some statistical experience, you probably have heard of this distribution. There's a distribution called the normal distribution or standard normal. So normal, you could think of as bell-shaped. Standard normal is a very specific bell shape that is centered at zero and has a variance of one. And that's always going to be true when you hear the word standard before normal distribution. And the PDF isn't given here, but this handout is really focusing on shortcuts that you're able to make use of. A new table is going to come into play here, which I will post um, before the next class. But just to associate a picture with this, standard normal is, again, it's going to be bell-shaped, centered at zero, with a variance of one. And so this is your mean. And this is your variance or standard deviation, because remember, standard deviation is square root of variance, and the square root of one is, is still one. <clears throat> so that is always what your picture is going to look like. And you're going to see a lot of these pictures in the next class. The reason is, is that we're going to make use of the standard normal distribution in order to find probabilities. And that is going to involve converting probabilities that are in terms of an x into a probability in terms of a z, which is called a z-score, which you could calculate based on the formula that I highlighted there. Z-score is represents a distance, and it um, you could just think of it as a distance in terms of a new unit. And what I mean by that is, if I just said the word distance, you know, most of you would probably think in terms of feet or inches. Maybe some some of you think in terms of meters, centimeters, things like that. Um, you could think distance in terms of time, you know, how long, what's the distance from here to West Palm Beach, you know, in terms of time, and you might say about two and a half hours. Um, here, I'm in Florida on the, the west side. Uh, you can do it more related to, uh, you know, how long does it take for you to get to the North Shore? And so you could think of that um, as a distance in terms of minutes or hours something along those lines. Z-score isn't going to be in terms of any of those units because it converts your original units into the unit of standard deviations. We, what I mean by that is a Z-score is a distance in terms of how many standard deviations away from the mean that you are. Whether that mean is in minutes, feet, seconds, you know, or whatever the, the length or distance is, <clears throat> that doesn't matter. It's going to convert into um, standard deviations. You know, I am 0.3 standard deviations taller than the average male. Or people, students take 1.2 standard deviations longer on my exams than my colleagues' exams. And I'm making these numbers up, so don't get scared. <clears throat> but uh, I'm just kind of giving examples of what a z-score means. And we'll get to, to actually computing z-scores in the next class. But at this point, I'm just going to, um, to leave you with that brief introduction. And then we're going to start there on, um, on Monday with actually computing z-scores and using those in order to find probabilities. Like I said, I am going to post or possibly link a, um, a z-score file to, to this handout or on the Lima so that you could access it um, now and on any future homework or quizzes that you may have. So any last questions? I'm going to stop a little early today, but any last questions or concerns that you might have? Um, I have a question about 
the chai squared when um you know what that one with the chart and stuff mm -hmm. when do you use the chi squared again whenever you have a chi squared distribution but an indicator is if you are finding a probability with respect to an unpleasant value and so what i mean by that is in the examples that we had gone through we could have used or tried to use a chi-square in let's say problem one b <clears throat> except we wanted a probability with respect to five five is it's a nice number it's simple there's no decimal places if you look at the table values <clears throat> you're really not going to have perfect integers you're going to have you know, 1.145, 12.83, and, and other values that are um, not so simple. And so when you have a probability using a gamma distribution where alpha is two, that's the first indicator that chi-square is even possible, and you are finding a probability of a number that isn't very attractive like we have in problem three that's an indicator that using the chi-square table may be an easier route it's certainly worthwhile to try to use the table and if you could find the value in there then great if you can't then you know trying to get the probability directly by integrating is is going to be the path that you take All right, so I am going to stop the video here. Again, thank you for um, great participation yet again. I hope to hear or see you guys more in the future, but we are gonna continue with continuous distributions on, uh, on Monday. I think we will finish this chapter. We probably won't get into the next one, but, but that's fine, our, our pace is okay. Have a great weekend. Don't forget there is another webinar assignment posted and I will see you all later. Is there a possibility we have a we have a quiz on July 11th?